Welcome to On the Line. I'm Christine Williams. Coming up for discussion on our Viewpoints panel. Big tobacco companies are fighting the federal government over ad restrictions. Later on, we'll be talking about taking risks among teens. Stay tuned. And these are the issues we'll be presenting today to our Viewpoints panelists for commentary. Three of Canada's largest tobacco companies have squared off against the federal government for what they claim to be their constitutional right to advertise. Black History Month. Is it valuable or necessary? A poll of 10,000 Americans showed mixed feelings about this month-long tradition. And a look at the practice of immigrants and refugees living in church basements to escape deportation. Later on, later on we'll be looking at risk-taking among teens, but first, let's meet our Viewpoints guests. Robert Metz is president of the Freedom Party of Ontario, and Dr. Gary Warner is past professor at McMaster University. Thank you both so much for joining me Pleasure today. Pleasure to be here. Thank you to be here. Now the battle again makes headline news. Ever so often it comes and it goes. Decades old battle when it comes to tobacco industries advertising. Now a Supreme Court decision is supposed to come down sooner or later because the constitutionality of banning such ads as well as having such stern warnings on cigarette, pack, cigarette packages have been a concern to these tobacco companies and we know why it's the bottom line. But is it really a big issue that should be back in the headlines? And I'm going to start with you, Gary. What do you think about it? Well, the reality is that <clears throat> the tobacco advertising is actually virtually banned in, for example, the UK and in yes. most um, industrialized countries. And uh, the reason for that is very simple. It's because um, we have um, rights, competing rights here. You have the, the oh, right... Always the case. Uh, yes. You have the, you have the right of... Uh, of companies to advertise, and that's the one that's to sell their products. Uh, f so in a way, it's an extension of free speech on the one hand. But on the other hand, we have to take into consideration the fact that, uh, that smoking and the use of tobacco is a health hazard. It's um, responsible for 30% of all cancer deaths. And therefore, um, th there is a there is a freedom here there's a in terms of the common good that also has to be has to be to be balanced so just as we for example think that we have to give up the, our, our rights to not wear a seat belt for example mm -hmm. um, similarly and, and, and this is even more serious and um, restrictions on the on the advertising of tobacco i think mm -hmm. is um, would trump, in my view, the, the, the right of companies um, to advertise. Good point, Robert. Your view on this. You know, I can't actually say I've ever seen a cigarette ad or any tobacco ad that said, if you don't smoke, start today. They don't do that. They're just competing for brand preference. That's really what advertising is about. But I think that from the tobacco industry point of view, I would think that these warnings on the packages are the greatest friend of the tobacco industry because it relieves them of any liability that may incur from health issues that caused by people who smoke. If you've got poison, a big poison sign on a bottle, and you drink the poison it kills you, they're not going to go back on the company that made the poison to, to pick up any liability. So I think this is a wonderful thing for the tobacco companies and yes, that, that they shouldn't point. really have to worry about it. It, it. To me, yeah, put it on there because mm -hmm. you've relieved us of the liability. Now what we see, of course, is you see these ads on the cigarette packages, or anti-ads if you want to call them that, um, and still people suing the cigarette companies for, for, for their behavior, mm -hmm. you know, and I think that's where we get into some dangerous territory. And Dr. Warner said something very interesting. He brought out the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which was cited here because a group of physicians for a smoke-free Canada said that when you look at the rights of these companies, it should not be used. Such rights should not be used actually when it comes to promoting such behavior which of course they're saying is harmful for society right. where do you draw the line saying, there well, I mean, they aren't promoting people, the behavior well well you see <laughs> I, I can't see how you could argue though the fact that um, advertising is always intended to promote mm -hmm. so you can say that yes they're advertising yes you could see one brand being promoted over the other but the bottom line is overall you see a product being promoted do you think this not has any does it have does not have weight for you there well, I see all sorts of liquor ads. I see all sorts of cigarette ads. I don't drink and I don't smoke. 
Now, how is that possible? Because if ads are so powerful <laughs> that they make you do something, then well, what well, does well, that ads say, don't you make know? you. They don't make you. And well, that's almost yes. the assumption, you know. And, mm -hmm. and again, of course, there's the children argument that always comes into it. But that's a whole separate issue, and I think that should not be mixed into an adult level of discussion. Because children are a whole separate category, I think. Children. Well, why are they separate categories? Uh, they don't have rights. That. They're under 18. They cannot consent. They cannot sign contracts. They cannot do a lot of things. Well, what that, about that this whole as notion about do. early conditioning? We know how powerful that is. Oh, it is absolutely. And I think uh, the conditioning is, is is in in the in, in the information. Give them the proper information. Don't lie to them. If they find out you've lied about something. And uh, even if you were trying to protect them, then you lose that much respect. I think we've seen that in, in, in drug prohibition and things like that, where there are a lot of untruths told. And even with cigarettes, I've, I've heard some, quote, honest, end quote, do uh, doctors on the radio often say, listen, people smoke for a reason. Uh, nicotine has beneficial side effects that people have. It keeps them awake. It keeps them alert. We know a lot of beneficial things from nicotine. In fact, it's being used in Alzheimer's research now. So to say that it's completely a one-sided thing and that people are just smoking because they want to kill themselves is an absurdity. Well, um, they don't deliberately want to kill no. themselves, although they, they are doing it. But well, a lot of habits will, will kill you. Just sitting in front of the computer all day and not exercising, I understand, yes, is not good for you either. Back. Do we need to add back to the equation <laughs> one more vice? Well, there you go. Is it the government's job to even, to uh -huh. even go there? And that ends up being a debate in itself because at what point should the government lay off and at what point is the government there to protect? For example, Dr. Warner made the example about um, seat wearing seatbelts and, and helmets. Or banning the use of cell phones, yes. for example, in, while driving. Well, These are simple examples because they're they, 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 they dangerous a long practices. standing yeah. debate. At what point yeah. do they intervene? At what point do they lay off? Yeah. That's, you know, that, that again. Now, you're a, you're a political where, person here yourself. So. Where, the, where does the government have jurisdiction? Yes. And yes. does the government have jurisdiction in private affairs? Does the government have jurisdiction in, uh, you know, on the roads? Because they own the roads, they have the right to make a certain number of rules on the road, just like you would in your home. If you had a private road, you could have people coming on that road and not having to wear seat belts. That would be okay. Yeah. But, but, but the impact yeah. of smoking yeah. has a public impact because you're talking about the, the, all of the people who have to be treated, all the people who develop cancer and who develop you know, other ailments as a result who have to be treated. Of their so, own behavior, though. Uh, but, but, second but, hand, but, you're but, talking but about the second all, hand. Mm -hmm. the second, whether it's second hand or first hand, I mean, we all are collectively responsible for those costs. So therefore... Um, this is not a private matter if, from mm -hmm. that point of view because there are repercussions. And I just wanted to add that, um, that um, we know, that, for example, the government of New Zealand... Well, let me did, you know, no, no, Let me finish what I'm saying. That, that there was research done in, in over 30 countries over a 15-year period. And that research demonstrated that um, by, if you do a comprehensive ban on tobacco advertising, you will effectively reduce the amount of smoking that takes place. Mm -hmm. So that, so that Advertising, advertising does have an impact, and it can be stopped. It can be stopped by comprehensive. Well, we all know that advertisers are willing to spend millions, billions of dollars when it comes to advertising. I mean, just look at a, the price of a 30-second ad when it comes to the Super Bowl, and that would tell you a lot. Robert, you wanted to say something. Before well, we go if ahead. if if smoking is is a public affair, then what? health concern of any individuals is not a public affair when we're all being paid for by public funds regardless of what disease we have. So I think Drawing the line definitely becomes an issue, but the secondhand smoke issue is a, is a serious well, one. Well, secondhand Robert. smoke is, is, again, you're violating someone else's rights. That's mm -hmm. another issue. You've got another person there. That's where the government does have a right to say something, particularly in protecting that that second person. However, not the way they've done it. Not by banning smoking in restaurants and bars and things like that where people have the freedom to go in or out. Well, you know, that's a different I, I, think, issue. I think you have to be very careful about the abuse of, uh, of the term freedom when that, when that freedom has repercussions. So I think that there are different freedoms that always yes. have to be weighed. And they conflict sometimes. They're We're not going to resolve this today, to but weighed, conflicting yes. freedoms yeah. are a huge issue. And there's no such thing as absolute freedom. That that's, is, there's that's no true. such thing. Well, We're going to have to I go disagree for on that. I know. Okay, <laughs> we're going to have to have you guys back to talk about what absolute freedom is all about. Yeah. <laughs> we're going to go for a break now. When we come back, we're going to be talking about Black History Month for or against. Stay tuned.
Welcome back to Viewpoints on the Line. The next issue we're discussing is Black History Month. Now, a poll of 10,000 Americans was conducted in the U.S. And what it found was this, that 43% of Americans believe that setting one month a year for this is, well, they, they describe it as a token gesture, while 39% say it's an opportunity, a great opportunity, to raise awareness. So we're discussing this. I mean, you're not having a consensus here, but the article that we have goes back into the history of how it was, um, it, it came into being in the first place, which I think is very relevant as we continue to discuss this issue. Now, I'm going to start with you, actually, on this, um, Gary. W what's your position? Do you think it's something good? Well, I, I understand all of the objections, namely that, well, there's tokenism, that there are too many things happening at the same time, that uh, outside of this uh, period of the year, then it's all forgotten. So I understand those things. My question, however, is uh, if we abolish Black History Month, would we be better off in terms of bringing these issues to public consciousness? And my answer to that question mm -hmm. is no. We would not be any better off. Um, because um, the, the origin of, of the celebration of, of, uh, of Black History Month I mean, has to do with the historical context and with our experience that, um, that mm -hmm. the African history, an African-American and African-Canadian history culture uh, were downplayed, ignored, mm -hmm. um, you know, and not considered. I always tell the story of Sir Hugh Trevor Roper, who, when I was at university in the 60s, mm -hmm. was, still, was still saying there is no history of, of Africa, only the history of Europeans in Africa. Mm -hmm. And my children learned something along those lines in, in terms of when th that, um, you know, they learned it, of, of the explorers. Yes. So they learned what Europeans did. And, um, and therefore, it seems to me that it is, mm. it is absolutely critical that we um, uh, rehabilitate uh, and that we, we, we recognize the contributions that go way back in history. Mm -hmm. Uh, and in, in our context in North America, um, I would argue that, um, that in terms of equality, so there's not just only at the cultural level, but in terms of, uh, of social acceptance, and et cetera, et cetera, that there is still a lot left to be done that justifies the, the promotion of a, of a Black History Month. Yes. Robert, your position well, on this? I think there is an African history. I, I know an African historian by the name of Dr. George Aidi, who I've met with personally. He wrote African okay. Indigenous Institutions, mm -hmm. gave me my autograph copy, and it's all about the history of Africa. and. Uh, even gets into free market, how the, the tribal leaders kept trade routes open and things like that. But I get very uncomfortable when you start to color history by a color, black history. Because if you're going to say black history, then t it seems to me that you have to exclude all other historical externalities by race. Because that, that, mm -hmm. black people don't just... Uh, interplay with themselves. They, they, they talk, you know, history yes. is a is, and, is and the that, big and that's picture. A, that's an essential argument, but I think it's also important to go we to delve back into the well. into the history here, because Carter Woodson was the man that brought this into being. Now, in 1926, he mm -hmm. actually created Negro History Week. Now, it's important to recognize here this was this was a man that was born in 1875, and he was the son of former slaves. He was unschooled, a coal miner, and he actually rose against the odds, and he ended up with a doctorate in history. From, um, from Harvard, believe it or not. But you see, his intention was to create a week that was celebrated among blacks at that time. But as time went on, it was very interesting how it expanded because then the whites started to become interested. And when you look at, as this article points out, which was, I thought it was very interesting because the article points back to the history with Abraham Lincoln, with Frederick Douglass, and whites became interested because they saw it as a, as a way to go ahead and there was an advantage when it came to gaining the black votes. So it ended up being expanded into Black History Month. So it's not as if somebody in a vacuum just said, well, let, let's just celebrate black history. It has a heritage in the States, given, given the history of slavery, given the civil rights movement, Abraham Lincoln, and so on. Would you describe so it evolved. Okay. It evolved into something today. Would you exclusively describe the history of slavery as black history? I wouldn't. I would describe no, there, it as part of American States. history, yes. uh, specifically of South yeah, But you do understand how it evolved. Oh, yes. You do understand how yeah. it evolved. So you're saying that now is the time to abolish it, that it's, it's served its, its purpose. Yeah. No, I think that... Because we could see how it evolved. It, it happened. Any history that's yes. relevant to where we are today is relevant. It doesn't matter mm -hmm. who the person is that was yeah. 
part of the consequence. Well, Go ahead. Fully, yes. fully yes. agreed. The, the, the point is that, that here, here you had history that for a very long period of time was taught that excluded a set of people. So when you say there, was, when you say yes. there was no black history or no white history, there certainly was. There certainly was, because the black well, people... Well, I just don't define it by black and white. I oh, define it no. by African or North but, but American. The man, the man instituted but, something to celebrate within his community. Understood. He didn't make the choice to expand yeah, yeah. it. So what I'm asking is, yeah. at this point in time, do you think it's time to abolish it? Do you think it's time that we say, okay, let's put a stop to it, okay? We understand how it evolved. Yeah. It's not a question of should it have been instituted. It was actually expanded by others yeah. beyond the fellow here that um, established it, but is it time, would you say, Robert, to abolish it today? Well, you know, in the article it talks about, for example, it's a good way to raise awareness of Amer African American history and accomplishments, mm -hmm. okay? Now, my experience has been accomplishments have, all, have not been done by a group. They've always been done by no, individuals. I, I hear what you're saying. I hear what you're saying. You know, and I'm not just but talking about evolved, black. I'm talking evolved, about any color. No, but I hear what you're saying. And, and I can't argue that there are many contributions with many races, ethnicities, in society, even religious groups, and so forth. I agree with you there. But this is something that evolves. So what I'm asking you, do you think it's time for it now, in our, in our point in history, to abolish it? The actual yes, observance the of yes, the month, the you mean? Yes, the observance of the month, based on how you're feeling about the history of it. Well, I don't know that I'd, I, I wasn't even really, I'm not even that yes. aware of it. It's something that is just talked about in generalities, right. really. It's not like an imposed <laughs> holiday on people or anything like that. And, yes. and it's important for me. Uh -huh. It's something that's particularly mm -hmm. important for me, but has a lot to do with uh, my sense of a broader community of which mm -hmm. I'm a member. Um, it's not the only community I belong to, but it's part of what defines me. And, um, and and uh, w the, the end point that we want to arrive at is that um, we do have a truly global history that takes into consideration all of the players. We don't, <laughs> in terms when we think of, of uh, and like in one of the courses that I taught, I mean, we, we, I had this description of, um, of, what, of the 19th century. And this 19th century was defined by European wars. The rest of the world just didn't exist. <laughs> So, so this is all has to do with exclusion, and this is a mm. this is a reaction to exclusion, and it is saying, look, you've got to include everybody, and so I totally agree that um, that his, this history is never in, it can't be in isolation. It, it is part of human history, and that's where that's where it belongs. But the point is, it must be included, and for the time being, to mm -hmm. get it included you have to hit on the table a little bit. And, and this is one of the contributions of Black History Month, is that at least during this time, you can't, mm -hmm. you can't forget about it. You we can't also exclude live in a, it. We also live in an era of inclusion. And, and, and I can just hear other people saying, well, then why not include this or include this as part of history? But I still say you can't get away from the history of how it evolved. Mm -hmm. And at what point do you say, look, it's time to include other groups. It's time to say goodbye to this. It, it ends up being an issue that well, you know, history, we need to confront. Yes. History becomes politics, OK? And history is rewritten constantly by the current political powers that be. I mean, uh, there's a fellow named uh, Ernst Zunder who's in jail in Germany for denying mm -hmm. history. Okay? And uh, that's his opinion. Yes. I don't think he should be. He, I never ever heard a charge of him doing any violence or anything, but he might be a nut bar or whatever. I, I like to okay. think of that. He's a nut bar, a dangerous but, but, nut bar, but, well, but, but still. <laughs> very dangerous. But still, when you start getting official histories by government, and you know, you can't speak against it, uh, it's almost like the global warming thing. You can't speak against it now because it's an official <laughs> statement by the government. Right? Also, more and more I are. Think, <laughs> I think all yes. sciences and anything mm -hmm. that's in an educational field has to be free and, and you have to be able to debate it and, and, and have and the controversy. That's why we're here. And I think that's what I that's what scares me about when government gets involved and it wants to hmm. end the debate. It it's wants to create a, a, an environment of some sort of fear so you don't challenge certain ideas. Interesting yeah. point. Yeah. Wow, we, we can go on forever. What have to do with this? Uh, yeah. Public, public education. Can, public education and the school education. system because that's yeah. really what we're talking about. Yeah. You wouldn't be faced with the problem if you had yeah. an education system. This can go on and on, you know, I know, but we're going to have to go on to the next topic when it comes to immigrants and refugees hiding out in Church's Sanctuary. We'll be talking about it after this. Stay tuned.
Hello again and welcome back to Viewpoints on the Line. The next issue we're talking about, it concerns a, a man out in Vancouver. There you go, refugee sheltering in church, arrested after calling police. Well, as it turns out, he's free now. But a couple days ago, he wasn't. In fact, he put in a call to police, and this was a personal call he put in. It was some life-threatening call, apparently, at the time. And the cop that was on duty at the time that came and made the arrest, she wasn't aware of the, the traditional... Um, well, the, the sanctuary, the way they, they seek sanctuary in these churches, that you don't arrest them, basically. You, you get, well, this is what we're discussing. Should it be done? It, it's a history of that in our country. People that hide out in churches. This guy here, he's facing a definite risk in Iran. Somehow it was turned down, his claim for refugee status years ago. And he felt his life was in danger. So the church, of which he was a part, kept him safe. And there you have it. There was an arrest warrant, but couldn't be touched for two years. I'm going to start with you, Robert. What do you think? Do you think this should continue to go on in our country? The concept of... Um, church sanctuary. Of sa church sanctuary? Yes. I think it will continue as long as people respect it, because that's really what it takes. There's a, there's a culture at work. If, if we lived in a culture that didn't respect it, you could write all the laws you want about church sanctuary, and it wouldn't be honored. And I think the only thing I know about this case is what appears in this National Post article that we had here, which mm. appears to be an error on the part of the police officer. And it looks mm -hmm. like from the, from the investigations they've done in the background that this person is indeed a legitimate, a legitimate refugee, case. N yes. refugee, not like mm -hmm. some of the other cases we hear about, actually being threatened, suffered torture, that kind of things. Uh, I would say this person's pretty legitimate. So Interesting point, because um, for the cases I've heard with people hiding out in the churches, I, I don't know if the two of you might have heard any that were not legitimate. But once it comes to this, they've been found, as far as I know, they've been found legitimate, to be legitimate. Yeah, well, the, the point is that, um, and I know that, like, for example, the Presbyterian Church, I, I was just reading it last night, has just put out um, some guidelines uh, which uh, summarize, the, I think, the, the approach of all of the mainline churches, because they've all been involved, all of the Christian churches, because obviously this is a tradition that goes back to the Hebrew Scriptures, to the New Testament, so it has mm -hmm. a good scriptural basis. The point is that, that the churches don't take people in this sanctuary situation lightly. Right. These cases are always, That's right. they're That's always, right. in, they're always investigated mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. very c carefully. The, the, there has to be evidence that's verifiable and that's independently verified to prove that mm -hmm. the person has a particular case. The congregations have to agree. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, there are penalties involved, so they have to be aware. You know, you can have, there's two, two years in prison, $50,000 mm -hmm. a, a penalty. So, so all of the cases of, of, of sanctuary, without exception, these have been thoroughly, thoroughly mm -hmm. investigated because before people are allowed to, you know, to use the church as a, mm -hmm. a, a, as a sanctuary. And I think, and it's also generally as a last resort. Yes, and, and, yes. And, and what this is pointing to is that there is actually an, um, a flaw, or many people have argued that mm -hmm. there's a flaw in our refugee determination system in that... Um, in that um, the, the uh, there is no direct appeal that's possible in when in against any judgment. Hmm. The once a judgment has been made, it can be appealed in terms of um, by a higher court yes. in terms of um, the pro the process the procedures that, that that were used. But in terms of the content, it cannot be appealed. So there's a bit there's a bit of a of a, of a, of a flaw in this particular case. We know that the the the, the gentleman and his mother. They both mm -hmm. appealed, you know, for refugee status at the same time under the same kinds of mm -hmm. conditions. He actually had been tortured in prison, right? And she was admitted, That's and he right. was not. Mm -hmm. So it, that was already a little bit of a clue that there was something, mm -hmm. something odd going on. In a, way, That's right. in a way, the church has almost formed a function that the government should have by, you know, you by, gotta, you by, by really being that there. filter, exactly. you know, that, that mm -hmm. did the investigation, that exactly. took the time to look into the person's family. You know, I, I don't know any specific instances, but I know I've read through history many times, even many totalitarian dictators will not violate the sanctuary of a church in the middle of a war mm, sometimes. Wow. So wow. there's obviously a very, very strong social, uh, some kind of feeling about it that, that it's just not something you do because even if you do it, you're going to incur more wrath of the people than you'd otherwise have to deal with. Mm -hmm. And I think what you're de dealing with here is trying to appeal to some 
as you say, the last resort for a sense of justice, mm -hmm. you know. We're not talking about hiding murderers or, or, oh, or you know. Oh, definitely not. So, so th that's why you have to, you're always working on that basis. And sometimes the government just fails and doesn't do its job properly, so it's up to the community to do it. Mm -hmm. And that often falls to church. Yes, and it's interesting how the outcome was. Citizenship and Immigration Canada decided to give him resident, permanent yeah. resident status. Well, isn't that interesting? So it worked yeah. out it worked. So we're to his <laughs> advantage yeah. that he got arrested instead of, otherwise he might still be in that church for that's another right. two years. Yeah. Right. Here's a spoke right. in the wheel. We live in such a, it makes me sick sometimes, I mean, <laughs> inclusive society to the point where people sometimes take leave of their, sentence, their senses and they say, well, if this is done, then why can't this be done? If we allow, for example, the, um, the, the, the polygamy in, going on in BC, then maybe we should be allowing it all over Canada. Although it's not allowed, but that's still up in the air. But you've got groups like that, that they'll point to one circumstance. They won't examine the whole circumstance around it and they'll say, well, why, why can't we be included? Every, every place uh, of worship, for example, and, and what if I have somebody that says, well, they can't go back to their country because they're going to suffer discrimination for X, Y, Z. Can this, in the current climate that we live in, open a can of worms? And again, in the current climate that we live in, of inclusiveness. In, in the current climate, I imagine there'd be people who might advocate things like that, but I don't think it would stick. I, it's, it's just not feasible. I mean, we, if we wanted to really argue, we could let's let's move a whole country over here because they're all being abused by their by their leaders. You know, we could we could argue to that point. Mm -hmm. But um, but there are those who aren't prepared to. But you know, I've, I have a friend in London, uh, Jeff Schlemmer, who I always debate with on a, another show, and he always says, you know, exceptions make make bad law. And if you're always talking about the exception as being the the standard on which you will base everything, then you're running into trouble because nobody else will fit into the into the pattern. Mm -hmm. Laws are generally are general. I think that's what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. That that they apply to most situations at most times and most circumstances. And occasionally somebody gets caught between a rock and a hard place mm -hmm. and they've got no other place to go. It's a good measure in mm -hmm. law. Mm -hmm. Gary, I agree. what do you say? You no, I, I, I agree with that with that statement, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. That um and, and this is um th this is a case where the the law has failed. <laughs> And yes. the churches have come to the rescue, and that, um, and that the sanctuary of churches. The word sanctuary is important in that in that this is hallowed ground, so to speak. This is holy ground, mm -hmm. and the, the issue more is now. Um, these have been Christian churches, so the issue is: um, is this something that would be is can, should be done exclusively by Christian churches, mm -hmm. as opposed, you know? Yes, but, and but that, I think, exactly, mm -hmm. and that could be a point. Mm -hmm. In just one yes, type well, of religion? Yes, why just the... Exactly. That's why I don't think mm -hmm. no, that would matter. Because that has, well, been, the, that has been the tradition. That has been the tradition. That has been the tradition, but there's no reason why... Um, Again, in terms of a of a of a, of a faith tradition um, which has um, consecra consecrated holy space, having that space used in this way with all of the precautions. Well, uh, I'm afraid the Christian, becoming, the Christian yes. Church has has the longest history it's of this as well, it so does, that's why it, it, it has to but you see, be there for a while before getting, it's a tradition. Some of that is also getting eroded, and, and and I'm harping on about this. It's another article that right now I'm in the middle of looking at it, and investigating it. But apparently, a man, and this came out in a paper. It was a very local, small paper applied to the Ministry of Transportation because he wanted a certain license plate that was um, very Christian in, in its content, well, personalized. Yeah, okay. and, and I've seen a lot of license plates that were personalized. Mm -hmm. But because it was Christian, this was the answer he got from the person that he was speaking to. Well, we can't go ahead with this because there are other non-Christians out there. Oh, but I, I've true. seen so many license plates that I would find personally offensive. Nobody cares. So we, we live in a society more and more where the fuzzy boundaries are anyway. That's another yeah, topic for another day. Other Robert and <laughs> Gary, thank you so thank much you. for joining yeah, us today. Thank you for having us today. Yes. We're going to go for a break now. When we come back, we'll be talking about, wow, risk-taking among teens. How to control it. We'll be back after this. Stay tuned. <laughs>
ground transportation provided by JP Motor Sales, located at 2320 Fairview Street in Burlington. Hello again and welcome back to part two of On The Line. I'm Christine Williams. Well, when it comes to risk taking among teens, you may be one of those parents that your kids have basically completely, in your opinion though, in your opinion, completely gone astray. And while well, you're wondering why, I mean, there could be many reasons for that, but our author today, Dr. Michael Unger, has authored a book called Too Safe For Their Own Good. He's a social worker, a therapist, and You've got Michael, thank you so much for joining us today. I appreciate the offer. It's I, great to be here. I can't wait to delve into this. Now, your premise is very interesting because you're saying that we're actually bubble wrapping our kids. There's one side that says we give our kids too much freedom, and the, and, but you're saying we bubble wrap our kids. Take a look at the McLean's headline this week. How we're killing kids with caution. Now, inside, you see an interview that was done with Michael. And it says, the opportunities to take chances, have adventures, take responsibility are the very things denied kids in good homes. So you're probably wondering, what's this all about? And Dr. Unger is going to be talking about it. Great. Dr. Unger, a, a difficult balance. It is for parents. And I mean, most of the parents, these ideas came out of working with parents who often are really concerned about their kids. They love their kids dearly. They, the kids are doing something, either they're, well, either they become very compliant children who are somewhat anxious, depressed, holding back from life, or, as more often was the case, they're kids who have come from really good, solid homes, and yet they still show up in my office with all kinds of delinquent problems, drug use problems, early sexual activity, all kinds of problems that the parents obviously want to, want to stop and, and save their kids from experiencing. And what, it began to, what I began to understand was, in fact, that, that sometimes the problem is that we're actually not giving our kids enough risk uh, and, in more specifically, enough opportunities to experience adventure and responsibility, which are sort of two sides of the coinage when you're thinking about, about risk-taking behaviors. And, in fact, what I was finding was that the kids and the families that I was working with, I mean, most of what's in the book, in, the, in Too Safe, comes from the families themselves. It's their wisdom, and it's their educating me to say, okay, if I have a kid doing this, how am I going to help them to do things, find that adventure, find that responsibility, without putting themselves or anyone else in harm's way? And that is the biggest challenge. Now, a lot of researchers have come up with this, that once upon a time, somewhere back in history, perhaps not too long ago when you consider the whole span of history, kids were really needed. They, they were the ones that looked after yeah. the farm. Yeah. There was a usefulness. And when I say usefulness, I don't mean by way of loving the kids and, and, and having them as your precious children. Right. A usefulness. They were needed well, as the, part of the, the economics of society. So they didn't have time to get into trouble, so to speak. But kids today, they're basically affluent, at least in our culture. And I'm talking generally. We know that poverty exists, yeah. but it's a different era. The book is very much tailored. I work all around the world. My, my own research is in the area of very high-risk kids from all yes. kinds of countries, Colombia, Russia, China, et cetera, et cetera, where there really is high risk posed to kids. That book is specific for parents who are in communities where there really isn't the risk that, that maybe they perceive. And really, it's in those communities, I think we need to offer our kids, well, what I call the risk taker's advantage, which is that all the good things that come from, like you described, way back when, when we did, in fact, encourage kids to look after the farm animals, look after their siblings, mm -hmm. walk mm -hmm. to school, take some, some, some uh, take opportunities that were provided them so that they could jump the maturity gap, right? That they could feel a little more adult-like, a little more like their parents earlier on. And of course now we've elongated, mm -hmm. the, we've stretched out adolescence for years and years and years. We've made and it a phenomenon. We've made it a phenomenon where before, and kids haven't changed. In 150 years since the Industrial Revolution, kids are still the same. They still wake up in the morning saying, how am I going to today be taken more seriously? Try it, even when they're 8 years old or 10 years old or 12 years old. They want to feel older. They want to have some responsibility. They want to feel adventuresome. They want to say, hey world, Look at me. And they're bored. I'm special. They're bored. Unfortunately, a lot of kids are being bored in this kind of, well, this bubble wrapping or in, in, in holding them back. And of course, what they're doing in the, in, the, in the absence of us as their adult, as their caregivers, showing our love by giving them some, some opportunities to experience exactly the same 
adventure and responsibilities we experienced when we were growing up, by taking those things away, we really haven't also given back to them substitutes. And we have to find substitutes that, that really do give kids, well, a sense of adventure, right? Mm -hmm. if, we, if they're not walking to school and we want them to be street smart, and we want them to have some sort of common sense, so eventually they grow up to be our employees and our businesses mm -hmm. and other places, and we want them to be a common sense, a, a creative employee. How are we structuring their lives now to, to get that there? Hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it's actually quite simple for parents in some respects because, I mean, a lot of people say, well, you know, so what's, what's the sequence? How do you yes. kind of find that? And, and I, I'm very, very much supportive of parents themselves thinking back to when they were kids. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the farms and those kinds of things. And if, if we ourselves, at the same age that, you know, if you have a child who's bouncing off the walls, who's doing things that's really putting themselves in harm's way, mm -hmm. I take that first as a communication. I'm saying this kid is asking me for some experience that I'm not providing. Next step then is to say, well, when I was their age, how did I get that, that aspect of my life fulfilled? Michael, very interesting. We're going to have to go for a break. But I, I, I'm glad you brought that up because some people are thinking, oh my goodness, what do I do with this kid of mine? He has mm. a death wish. How do I manage that? How do <laughs> right. I control it? We'll be talking about it after this. Stay tuned. Control was a bad word. <laughs> Hello again and welcome back to our program. We're talking about risk among teens. Joining us in the studio, Dr. Michael Lunger, who is a social worker, a therapist, and he's authored the book called Too Safe for Their Own Good. Now, an article was written about him in McLean's. In fact, it was a front page article that we see this week. Now, Dr. Unger, there, there are people that are thinking, okay, what have I done to bubble wrap my kids? Let's, let's give a list for those parents to understand sure. where you're coming from. Well, the kinds of things that the kids who, who come in to see me because they found substitutes that put themselves in harm's way usually talk about that they have 
limited um, say over things like related to their body, so they become anorexic, right? They don't have a say over how they put their hair, they don't have a say over what they eat, they don't have a say over those kinds of things, maybe what color their room is, those kinds of things. They also talk about not having work opportunities or volunteer opportunities. They also don't have access to what I call dangerous toys. After all, we, we need to have access to small pocket knives when we're a child if we're going to learn how to deal with more dangerous things later on. We need to also navigate around our communities. Can we get from point A to point B? Not only will our kids not necessarily suffer the problems of obesity and things, but they're also going to develop the street sense and the street smarts to know how to navigate their communities and keep themselves a little bit safer when they grow up. Rites of passage, all those other experiences too that unfortunately are waning in our society, those kinds of religious and spiritual uh, transitions as well from, from childhood to adulthood in however they, whatever form they take, there are lots of moments that we can help kids feel older. We can help them get there without them having to choose risk-taking behaviors that we'd rather them not choose. But you're not saying, and I'm going to emphasize not, because it could come across that way. You're not saying just let our kids loose. No. There's a knife sitting there in the kitchen, or there's a scissors over there, or don't forget that piece of glass over there. You're not saying just let her rip and let them do whatever they want and experiment. This is not what you're saying. In fact, quite the here. opposite. Um, what I'm saying is, in fact, the message here is not no. It's not permissiveness. It's, it's not permissiveness. No, and it's, it's not coming down on the no wait stop side either. And it's also not coming on the, oh, I'm just going to go and uh, sit in the back room and have my coffee and you guys go out and I'm not going to know where you are or anything <laughs> like that. It's kind of saying, look, why don't we coach our kids? Why don't we actually help them find appropriate risks and response? Why don't we put the helmets on them and then go to the toboggan hill? Because I know that's been a controversy, right? Should the mm -hmm. kids have helmets on toboggan hills? Well, let them put the helmet on so they... So when they crash, they don't hurt themselves. But then build the biggest six-foot leap of death that you can build and push them hard and make sure that they go and have a really good high adventure time. And it's a little bit of that because if they do that when they're younger, then these are kids who I, I, I've learned from my practice are not going to have to experiment with other more dangerous things like drugs. Like ghost riding. <laughs> like ghost riding? <laughs> Nothing to laugh about. No. It's a oh. new phenomenon in the States now where the kids with this whole um, speeding and reckless driving oh, you, and they yeah, come the out drifting. and they dance and they drift and they, yes. 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 It's a pretty scary phenomenon. But, but kids do that. If you've never had any experience on a small motorcycle or a small vehicle or never operated a scooter of some kind, then when you finally get yourself, you have an age of, that you can have a license. I worry. I worry for my own safety, being on, walking on the streets, but I worry about kids who aren't getting any kind of incremental moments in their lives in terms of developing some responsibility and some sense of, of, of what they can do in terms of adventure. And that's really what the book goes into. It talks about lessons learned from parents. Like, for instance, we all worry about those unsupervised house parties, don't we? Mm -hmm. Our kids, you know, our 14-year-old yes. daughter is going to where the, obviously there's going to be older kids, there's going to be the possibility of drugs, alcohol, all those kinds of things. Unfortunately, just simply telling a kid like that, because they've already opted, they've already said, I'm looking for some experience. I need mm. this from you. To simply say, oh, stay at home, stay in the basement, bring over some girlfriends, we'll give you a popcorn and a movie. The kid is going to basically say no. We're, they're going to run to the street. They're going to do something else that's crazy. What I've learned from parents who are successful with kids like that, and this is their wisdom, is we need to offer a substitute that has just as much hype and currency to them. Mm. So they have, you know, they have bragging rights. And so, it has to be, though, within the comfort zones of the parents. Yes, it does. Because, yes. And, well, and that's a very big point. Mm -hmm. So in that case, send the girl to some sort of concert. Let her do something that the family really values. And her peer group will look at her and go, wow. Maybe it's getting on an airplane and going to another part of the country where they have family or something like that. Something that she can, you know, say, I might not be able to go to that house party. But that doesn't mean that I'm not, and these are often the four messages kids want to hear, is I belong. I'm trustworthy, I'm capable, and I'm responsible. And if we can get, th so, so the message here is, let's say yes. Let's say yes and provide those opportunities for kids to hear those four messages, and, and then they'll be really ready for life. Now, this can be a really slippery slope, and it could come across dangerous if you don't know how to manage it, because yes. what I'm going to be asking about after the break is when it comes to active parenting, what that means in this particular context. We'll be back after this. Stay tuned.
Hello again and welcome back to our conversation, Taking Risk Among Teens. Dr. Michael Unger is with us. Now, Dr. Unger, we were talking about, well, the responsibility factor, not when it comes to the teens at this point, but even when it comes to the parents, active yeah. parenting. The last thing you're trying to teach us here is just leave your kid alone, just close the door, whatever it does, it does, it's gaining experience anyway. This is not what you're talking about. Not yet. at all, no. In fact, I, I like to use the term concerned parents because those are mostly who I work with. Even the, mm -hmm. even the most, the kid who's are bouncing off everywhere, what I meet are concerned parents consistently. And what they're really trying to do is they're trying to keep their kids safe, which, which makes perfect sense. But I do, I do encourage them to think back to how it is that they matured and what they learned along the way. And I, I love to actually ask when parents visit with me, they, they often come to me and say, well, you know, fix my kid, right? And I go, well, I, I, I can't. He's jumping I mean, out windows. You know, I, 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 well, I can't because first we have to sort of talk about, you have to understand why he was doing something dangerous or running off to the street or whatever. And we have to understand what it is that's attracting him to, to those particular high-risk activities. And once we got that, the second step, of course, is to talk about us. Every family has its own culture its own background, its mm -hmm. own unique ethnicity, its own, its own expression of its religion, its own value system. And on each and every case, as I show in the book from many different families, examples, each and every case, they have a unique solution, a unique way of saying that this is an acceptable risk for my child and this is not. And I really, I don't have the answers per se. I don't say this is the, the cookie cutter solution. I want families to think back, first of all, to when they were that age. If, if, if I'm dealing with a mother or a father and they're saying, well, help my kid, I'll say, well, first of all, what were you doing at that age in terms of taking adventure, bringing adventure into your life? And they often recount long stories of things that were quite positive, sometimes negative, and then you ask them, what did you learn? What did you learn from that experience? And often they say, there's all kinds of things I learned. And then I say, how is your child going to learn those same lessons? And once you get that, once you get them to think about how their child is going to learn exactly the same lessons that they learned by you know, driving that moped or, or milking the cows or, or having a, a, some sort of um, a knife when they were younger or whatever it was, whatever the adventure, whatever the responsibility that they had, they have to still share that with their child. And simply saying, no, wait, wait till you're grown up, all those things are not going to bring the kids through those moments. They have to learn by doing. And so that's very much what the book is about, about trying to, trying to offer perhaps some strategies, but also offering parents some clues to, mm -hmm. to, to really look at ourselves because the answers are inside our own families first and foremost. That's what I believe. Every family I've worked with has been different and each has really shown me that, that there are unique solutions. So, you know, the mother doesn't want her child going out to the house party. She arranges for the child to go to a concert instead. Another family. Mm, you're very constructive. Very constructive, very concrete suggestions from parents about what each can do. If you don't want, if you, if you can help your kid to express themselves through their body, uh, attirement, and hair, and everything else, many families find that that actually solves their, their drive to uh, necessarily drift into some of the problem, things like anorexia or even uh, mm. drug use and this kind of thing because they have, they have control over their bodies. They don't have to let, they don't have to to express that in a particularly difficult way. Like the kids I meet in jails who unfortunately mm -hmm. when I work with them will come in and brag about that I took this many drugs and my body, I was able to overcome this and they have all these big stories about their success. And if you, if, rather than condemning them, I stop and I say, well, you're telling me a very vivid story of what you, you lived through and challenged. And I say, well, where else could you have found that challenge in your world? And often sadly, they say nowhere. And I say, well, if we offered you some other kind of challenge, maybe an outdoor challenge, an urban challenge, some kind of bigger experience of yourself, would you accept it? Would you try it? And very often the kids will say yes, especially if their parents are watching and supporting them. And as we just Cheering started this, they are concerned mm -hmm. and they provide the structure. It's like kind of providing a box around our kids. Our kids want a box. They really do. And kid after kid, even the most delinquent and deviant and troubled kids I've worked with have said, I just wish someone would shape a box around me, give, give wow. me some boundaries so that then I can, I can find my own way. But, but, but the box, the boundaries are very helpful. Wow. Just make it big enough. Very, very interesting stuff you're saying here because okay. on one hand, some parents are going to have to learn how to say yes 
Yes. But how to manage that yes. Well that's said. the essence of what you're saying. I, I really like that, what you're saying. Exactly. Wow, Dr. Unger. Now, we've had up your website. Can you say where else viewers can get a hold of this? Um, well, the book is basically available at any bookstore across Canada. Mm -hmm. It's distributed by uh, McClellan and Stewart. Uh, it's in every bookstore uh, across the country, as far as I know. Yes. And um, I'll be touring different cities as well with it. So the very best to your audience. Dr. Unger, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. See you again on our next program. I'm Christine Williams, and from all of us, thank you for watching.